In this video, we're going to go over post-translational modifications. Post-translational modifications are covalent modifications to a protein after peptide synthesis. These are covalent modifications, meaning that we are breaking or forming chemical bonds. This is not looking at intermolecular forces. These modifications can occur along many places in a protein, including the N-terminus, the C-terminus, or the side chains of the amino acids. Now, there are many types of post-translational modifications. For each type, you need to know what the modification actually does to the structure of the protein, as well as some common examples where these modifications have a substantial effect on protein function. We're going to start first by looking at phosphorylation, which is by far the most common type of post-translational modifications. It involves the addition of a phosphate group to a protein. And there are two common examples where this is used. One is for reaction coupling, and the other is to regulate enzyme activity. If you recall, reaction coupling is the idea where there may be some chemical process that we want to happen, but it's energetically unfavorable and therefore non-spontaneous. We can couple this unfavorable process to a favorable one like ATP hydrolysis so that the combined process is spontaneous and will occur. One example of this is looking at the sodium potassium pump. So the sodium potassium pump is responsible for pumping three sodium cations out of the cell and two potassium cations into the cell against their concentration gradients. This is a non-spontaneous process. So essentially what needs to happen is that ATP needs to add a phosphate onto the sodium potassium pump. So once the sodium potassium pump has been phosphorylated, then it will be able to catalyze that process of transporting ions. The other example is regulating enzyme activity. So there's a lot of enzymes out there where they are inactive without the presence of a phosphate group. So once these enzymes are phosphorylated, then they will become active. There's also the opposite. There are some enzymes that are active when they are not phosphorylated. So the addition of a phosphate group will actually inactivate these proteins. So phosphorylation as well as dephosphorylation is a very important mechanism for altering enzyme activity. Our second type of post-translational modification is acetylation. This involves the addition of an acetyl group. For the MCAT, you do need to know what an acetyl group looks like. And we have an example here on this diagram. So on this diagram, you can see how the side chain of amino acid is being acetylated and involves the addition of an acetyl group. Now, acetylation, a very important example is histone acetylation. So if you recall, the structure of DNA with its sugar phosphate backbone means that DNA has a negative charge. DNA is wrapped around histone proteins that have a lot of basic amino acids and is positively charged. If you were to acetylate histones at basic amino acids, that would remove the positive charge of the histone proteins. That would cause the negatively charged DNA to bind to the histone less tightly. This makes the DNA more available for transcription and can increase the transcription of genes. So here, you should know that histone acetylation can alter gene expression. Next, we have glycosylation. Glycosylation is the addition of a carbohydrate to a protein. There are two examples of this. There are some situations where addition of a carbohydrate will help the protein fold into its proper form. Another example is with viruses. So viruses have a protein coat, and generally they are recognized as foreign by the immune system and will be destroyed. But viruses are capable of coating their proteins with carbohydrates. And by covering their protein coats with carbohydrates, it allows them to be shielded from the immune system. Okay. Next, we have hydroxylation. Hydroxylation is the addition of a hydroxyl group, an OH group. This is important for detoxification. 
And that's because many toxins that organisms can encounter are hydrophobic. As hydrophobic compounds, they cannot be excreted in solutions because they don't dissolve in water. So hydroxylation will oxidize the compounds, and when you oxidize the compounds, you're introducing the OH group, which is polar. This can allow these toxins to then dissolve into water and then be excreted. So again, hydroxylation oxidizes compounds for detoxification. Methylation is exactly as what it's called. It's the addition of a methyl group. And similar to acetylation, methylation can also alter gene expression. So there's many examples of DNA being methylated, in some cases increasing gene expression, in others decreasing gene expression. Now, more often than not, DNA methylation will decrease gene expression, but not always. A very famous example of decreasing gene expression is in females where one of the two X chromosomes is inactivated in each cell. And this is for dosage compensation to make sure that females are not expressing too many proteins from the X chromosome. And this process of inactivating an X chromosome is due to or is done by DNA methylation. All right, so next we have ubiquitination. Ubiquitination involves the addition of a ubiquitin molecule to a protein. The ubiquitin acts as a tag that essentially marks the protein for degradation by the proteasome. Next we have cleavage. Cleavage involves the hydrolysis of a peptide bond. So essentially whatever peptide was synthesized, it's gonna be cleaved into two or more pieces. And this cleavage is important because there are many situations in biology where this cleavage is required to convert proteins into their active forms. So a couple very common examples are with prehormones and zymogens. So zymogens are enzymes that are inactive. And if these zymogens are cleaved, then they can be converted into their active forms. So a very common example is within the stomach, your stomach releases pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is an inactive form of an enzyme. It can be cleaved into pepsin, which is then an active protease that can cleave protein molecules. The last one is disulfide bond formation. Remember, the formation of disulfide bonds is a covalent modification. So it can be considered a post-translational modification, and it's important for stabilizing protein structure. And here, we can actually take a look at this diagram, which is a nice example of both disulfide bond formation and cleavage. So this is looking at insulin. Insulin is translated as pre-pro-insulin. This form of insulin is not active. The first thing that needs to happen is that the disulfide bonds need to be formed in this peptide chain. Once the peptide has formed these covalent bonds from the disulfide bridges, we now have what is called pro-insulin. The next step is cleavage. So there's actually part of the peptide chain that gets cleaved and removed to form the mature form of insulin, which is essentially two separate peptide chains held together by disulfide bonds. Okay, so these are the different types of post-translational modifications that you want to know for the MCAT.